Right. I'm, I'm not going to touch anything else, and hopefully it'll work. Wow. <laughs> Alistair. Thank you. This is Creative Web, building dynamic websites for work and play. I'm Alistair. I'll skip the intro. Dave's already done that. This was meant to be a surprise, but I guess we've all sort it, seen it, so pretend this is new. Um, start with a bold statement. A lot of the web is boring. Immediately going to climb down from that, however, because I don't want to upset anyone. Um, that's absolutely fine. For most websites and businesses, that makes the most sense. But what I worry, however, is that developers may do boring because it's easy, because creative and fun seems hard, or it doesn't fit with a tech stack, or there isn't enough time to do it. I want to dispel that and hopefully show a few things that are maybe easier than you think, of, think they are that um, can make websites a bit more exciting. First, a bit, little bit of admin. These slides are available now at acute.io slash SOTB if you want to follow along online or anything like that. There are some animated demos and videos showing what I'm doing, so they're reasonably slow with no flashing or dramatic movement. Um, there's no getting around the fact these are visual effects. I'll do my best to explain them so they're accessible for all. Um, and so I don't bore everyone to death. Uh, I had a previous version of this talk where um, it had lots of code samples, and I bored myself self to death. <laughs> so not much code, but there are uh, blog posts that I've written that have all those codes in there, code and demo. Finally, keep your hands and feet inside the cart at all times. Um, I'm here to show you alistershepherd.uk. This is my, my personal website. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna make a <laughs> I was going to make a joke here about how the fact that I'm only here because Dave quite likes it, but he's already stolen that line, so I'll just move on from that. Um, it has a few creative features that, with the web platform, don't take too much to implement, but do a lot to make the website interesting. Uh, this video is demonstrating a few of them, and they are a vanilla parallax um, using custom properties, uh, CSS calc, and a little bit of JavaScript, uh, live color pro theming with custom properties, uh, with a color theme system and generative SVG section dividers. First, a little bit of background on my ideas and this website. So the design of the slides of my website is maybe familiar to some of you. Uh, it's inspired by the video game Firewatch, if you've played that at all. Um, I like the game, but it's the promotional material. It's these wallpapers, these images that I absolutely love. The single tone, um, bright color schemes of landscapes um, is really my sort of thing, and I adore them. So when I put common web designs aside, I couldn't get this out of my head. This is an old version of my website, um, and it had in the background a, uh, um, a video, background video that was, originally my plan was a live stream. Um, it became a 24-hour time-synced video, and that's because I have this feeling that a lot of websites we produce are static. They are kind of sit in a static, timeless cage. They don't change very much, and maybe there's some blog posts, maybe there's some user-generated content. But I really like the idea of what if you had a website that reached out and interacted with the environment around it somehow. Um, so this was the idea that every you go on a web, the website 10 minutes later, and it's different. It's different from what it was before. That's a lot of work, energy, and bandwidth, as I've discovered when I looked at my hosting bills um, <laughs> for what is really just a nice effect. Um, but the idea really struck with, stuck with me. So in 2019 and 2020, I started working on a new personal website to take some of these ideas into account with a theme of nature and, and mountains, um, possibly inspired by the design of Firewatch um, and changing with something environmental like the date, weather, time, something on those lines. So I used the unique skills, the talents that only I have to really show what I can do by asking my sister to help me with it. Um, <laughs> she's, she's an artist, creative ideas and code I'm good at, but anything art or design, I'm absolutely terrible. Um, so I commissioned this. It's a landscape in the style of Firewatch um, of the Kingo Mountains near where I grew up in the Scottish Highlands. So it's one that's quite familiar to me um, that I really like and is the basis of the website and the start the slides. One more thing before I get going, though. There's lots of amazing web talks today, 
talking about upcoming web features. And, but for this talk, what I say, what I mean when I say modern CSS is anything released in the past decade that you can use in all browsers now, no worries at all, um, because a l the cutting wedge of cutting edge of the web is really exciting, but so are lots of features that have been released relatively recently that you may not have had the chance to learn or need reminded about. For the most part here, I mean CSS custom properties and CSS calc, which are power pretty much every website I put together uses them probably more than they should, but um, I find they revolutionize CSS and the capabilities of it. Oh. Graphical issues, fantastic. Okay, well, it's not meant to look like that color, but hey. <laughs> um, so this is my first topic, um, uh, simple parallax using custom properties, calc, and a small amount of JavaScript. Um, I want to take this landscape, make it feel like the user was more involved, make it more dynamic and interactive. And parallax felt like a natural way of doing that, adding a bit of perspective, a bit of depth to the page. Um, although, as I've been making this talk, and I've been seeing this all of the time, seeing this parallax, I kind of realize it's a bit of a weird effect in that it's like the user's slowly sinking into the ground as, as you scroll <laughs> down, but it's, it's a nice effect. I just try not to think about that too much. Uh, a brief recap on what parallax is. Um, it's an effect where you have the main scroll of the page, and then different layers either in front of or uh, in front of or behind the main content that scrolls at a different speed, adding an extra layer of depth to the page. It was used quite a lot five to 10 years ago, but it's slightly less common now. So before I get into how I do it, I should probably address the parallaxed elephant in the room. <laughs> when I mention my website has parallax, I sometimes get the response, or even if I don't get the response, I can see it in, in people's eyes. Really, parallax? That's so 2015. Um, and there is a point there. It can be and has been overused, implemented poorly in some cases, and in some cases you see implementations that barely consider performance or accessibility nearly as much as they should. But where it does make sense and enhances the page and is implemented well, it can be a nice effect. Like many techniques, and it's done badly, it can be a bit tacky or, or used too much. This is the ideal way of implementing parallax on the web um, using 3D transforms. So we have the perspective property and a transform using translate Z to move a layer of the page into a different depth um, and the perspective property on the scroll container makes, adds the parallax straight away. This is better than using JavaScript. This is everything you need and the browser handles it all on the GPU, so it performs way better on low power devices than JavaScript solutions. I am now going to show you a JavaScript solution though, so, um, it, but if you're implementing it, try CSS first. This is an article on Chrome developers that has a full performance parallaxing, goes into all the details of how you, how you do that. But I tried to do that first, but with, turns out with really large and complex SVGs, you've ended with some pushing, you push the boundaries a little bit of what, uh, what that can do. So I hit some performance compatibility issues. So if you run into something like those or you want more flexibility with how it exactly works, then you could use JavaScript. So the example I'm going to go through is quite lightweight and can be used for and extended to lots of different situations. Before we get onto that implementation though, quick summary of CSS custom properties, if you've ever used them or as a recap. Um, Custom properties, also known as CSS variables, are a way of storing uh, value in CSS for reuse later. Um, so you declare them on an element with uh, double hyphen the name and then the value, and then it's available to that element and all of its descendants. We can then use them within that element, uh, like the H1 here, color var, color primary, and the var function allows you to use them wherever you'd like within CSS. You can also read and, read and assign them, from JavaScript with element.style.set or get property. Go back to that parallax. It often has a bit of a bad rep, and a lot of that is because, as I said, it's been implemented poorly. Um, but with relatively little modern CSS and JavaScript, we can do it ourselves without too much work, and it ends up being pretty good in terms of performance and accessibility. 
and that's using custom properties, the cat function, and a little JavaScript. So this is all of the JavaScript. You don't need to read all of it. The main point is on, uh, on every frame using request animation frame, we read the scroll position, and then if it's changed, we put it in a custom property. In this case, I've called it scroll pass. It's the scroll, current scroll position in pixels, and then we can use that within CSS. So that's all the JavaScript needed. And the real action happens in CSS with the transform property. So here I have a transform property with a translate, translate y to move the element up or down the page, the calc function to perform a calculation. We multiply the scroll pos custom property, which we just set up, with an offset. More on that in a second. And finally, at the bottom here, we're disabling uh, the uh, parallax where the user has a prefers reduced motion of reduce, just so if a lot of it movement is going to be an issue for someone or they prefer less movement on the page, then we can make the site pleasant experience for all. So this is the offset property I was talking about with some custom property magic. So one of the things I love most about custom properties is that you can inline them within the style attribute of your markup, which means that we can, even though these all have the same class of layer, we can abstract it slightly. So the layer acts kind of like a function in this case, and the offset custom property, like an input variable. Layer performs a different thing ever so slightly depending on the parameter of offset we pass in, which allows us to keep the, uh, the CSS really simple. So here we have the offset, which multiplies by that scroll position. So with an offset of zero, the element wouldn't move at all. It multiplies to zero movement, no matter what the <laughs> scroll position is. Offset of one is the same as the, sc as the scroll position. Then between that is varying degrees slightly slower than the scroll position. So here I've taken each layer of my landscape, popped it in a div with a layer class, given it a offset that looks about right, and here we go, we have that, uh, that parallax effect. So the key is that offset property, changing how much scrolling, scrolling happens per layer, and that's basically the transform with the calc and that being updated from JavaScript handles that. So here I'm just scrolling down the page and the layers scroll at different speeds. So that's basic parallax put together. There are some enhancements we could do to tweak or improve it. Um, you saw in the video of my site earlier, earlier, it looked slightly different. It scrolled almost a bit jelly-like behind, behind the actual scroll position. You could try different effects, so that's a delayed effect I tried with, uh, with my site that makes it feel a bit different. Not sure if I love it, but we'll see. Um, and in some cases, you could, I could simplify the images and implementation to use CSS perspective to make better performance. This, as I said, based on a blog post, um, a blog post on Simple Parallax, um, you can go check out my website, go check that out if you want to get the demos, the code, all of that, and I'll, this will all be posted in, the, in my slides after the talk. Okay, so next I'm gonna cover, oh, what is going on there? <laughs> that, that, okay, that looks a bit better. It is totally different color from what I've got here, but oh well. Um, serves me right for building my own slide system. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so next, color, color themes and time syncing animated color changing. Um, so I wanted this landscape and website to not be fixed, uh, to be constantly changing, like I said before. Changing over the course of a day with the time felt like a fairly natural and easy way of doing that because we can get the time and whatever um, easily in JavaScript. This concept has actually been one of revisited time and again. Uh, one of my first ever coding projects was a script updating my wallpaper with the time and the weather in, in batch. Um, since then, I've regularly had something similar. So I think it, it felt about time I did it on my website. Going back to this image, it's a great example of how all that's needed to give the impression of time changing in an illustration like this is the colors used. So this is, I mean, it was originally the exact same image. I just spliced three, the three different color schemes into one image. But we've got blues and purples on the left looking like night or morning. 
in the middle a kind of brighter orangey day, and then on the right a kind of evening yellows and warm, warm browns. So if I change the colors in my landscape, I could give the impression of time changing in the exact same format we have here. And as on the web we can transition between colors pretty arbitrarily, we could have a unique color for every moment of the day. And synchronizing that with the user's current time would be a cool effect. So I came up with several color schemes for morning, day, evening, and night that would be chosen as a static theme or animated between. So let's dive in. First, we need to set up those colors as a system of custom properties. So custom properties in modern browsers make color schemes and theming super easy. Um, basically just stick them in some custom properties. Here I've used C0 to 3, but it could be color primary, color secondary, background color, and then use them within our HTML, uh, HTML, CSS, the other one. Um, <laughs> use them wherever they're needed depending on what color we need, and they're only, the actual colors are only declared in one place. So depending on the theming method, we could update them in CSS, HTML, or in JavaScript. So here I'm updating the color scheme on button click using JavaScript, and this is just a case of click the sunrise button, update the custom properties with the sunrise theme. And here I'm just toggling between those. So we've got that basic theme system set up using custom properties. Now let's look at animating them. So because of accessing and manipulating with JavaScript, that's a bit of a spoiler as to how we're gonna do this, uh, storing these in JSON. So these are my four color schemes. Uh, I've got colors property, which has key value pairs for, for all the different colors. The name property, which just lets me go, yeah, I'd like the sunset theme, please. And the app property I'm using to power to declare at what point the animation, at what point in the animation the theme is active. So to make it easier for myself, we use 24 hour time. So we've got zero, six, 12, and 18 becomes uh, 12 a.m., 6 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m. respectively. But how do we, so we've got that data format pinned down, but how do we animate those custom properties? My first thought was CSS animations, make it really easy put an animation on, make it 24 hours long, bosh, done. But turns out as soon as I actually went to code that, I realized, hold on, you can't declare where an animation starts in CSS. So you land on the website at 3 p.m. How can you say halfway between these two keyframes? And that's, can't do that. So maybe transitions to, well, transition the custom properties with a bit more control. But it turns out that um, the colors change instantly if we do that, even if the transition is set. And that's one of the limits of custom properties and the browser doesn't know how to interpolate them, how to animate them, because they could be anything. They could be a length, they could be an angle, they could be a URL, a color, all sorts. The Houdini project is a new set of CSS APIs that is designed to help with this, which adds an app property at rule, um, which allows declaring the type of a custom property. So we could say, this is a color, and the browser knows, okay, right, we'll animate it like a color then. Fortunately, especially when I, when I was building this site to begin with, it isn't supported across all browsers yet. The support isn't quite there, but if you're watching this in a year or two, this is probably the way to go. So that leaves us with a custom JavaScript implementation. So let's break it down into the different steps. I'm not going into the exact implementation because it ends up being mostly maths and manipulating JavaScript objects, which is not the most fun content. Um, but if you're interested, again, check that out. Um, so first we have an animation loop. Depending on speed, it could be with every frame or every few seconds. Then we could get the progress through the animation. So for a 24 hour long animation, progress through the day. For a 60 second, for a 60 second one, progress through the minute. Um, remember those app properties. So with those, we could get the previous and the next states. So you land on the website at 2 p.m., the previous one's day at 12, and uh, sunset at 6. We could then work out how far we are between them, so in that case, 33%. With that progress percentage, for each color, we could get an intermediate color. So interpolation is a way of uh, giving two values and a progress and working out the value in between those that point. 
so you can get a color that is 33% of the way from day to sunset. Update the custom properties and CSS handles the rest. So with that, we have an animation between the color schemes. This is just going through those four themes we saw earlier. Thankfully, seems mostly correct. Um, JavaScript does a bit of maths to work them out, but it's intentionally ignorant of the page structure. It's just updating custom properties on the HTML element. And that's one of the things that I find really amazing about custom properties in that you can leave, it adds a method that gives you the ability to leave the bit that JavaScript's best at to JavaScript and the bit that CSS is best at to CSS. So that looked pretty good, but the transition between colors wasn't quite what I'd hoped. I don't know if you noticed up here, maybe not with on the, on the projector, but between the, between the colors, it went a bit gray and dull. Uh, it didn't look quite as vibrant as I wanted. And it turns out that that's due to specifying and interpolating colors in RGB using the RGB function. But that's not the only way of formatting and displaying colors on the web. So linear interpolation works out an in-between color by getting a middle value for each parameter of the color format. So we have RGB, which has red, green, and blue. It gets a middle value for red, then separately one for green and one for blue, then combines that together into a new color. But other, colors for co other color formats express colors in different ways, and they interpolate colors differently, resulting in different ones. Uh, so up here is the exact same color in five different color formats. So we've got hex, RGB, HSL, lab, and LCH. Uh, HSL is a different way of specifying, um, of expressing RGB colors, but there's also alternate color spaces, uh, which when paired with a compatible browser and display can express colors RGB even can't. Now that's an entire different talk, and I thought about putting some of it in here, and it just, it's too much. It's a whole talk in itself. Um, but the point is, we can convert these to and from RGB in some format, and by expressing colors in different ways, just by having different numbers, different parameters, means it gives us different options for interpolating. So these different ways of expressing produces different results when we animate. Um, so this is a demo of how the exact same code and themes work, look in different color formats and spaces. Some normal, some a bit less normal. Um, <laughs> RGB in the top left is the one we saw before and goes to kind of grays and goes a bit dull. Lab is what I use on my website in the top right. Um, that is a bit more vibrant. That's a different color space and, uh, and yeah, it's a bit more vibrant than, than RGB. HSL is fun. Um, <laughs> it, it was my, uh, a year or so ago, I thought, oh, I've heard about this heard about color formats and spaces, so let's update my website to use HSL, because that sounds like exactly what I'm looking for, and I did it and immediately went, oh no, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't it at all. Um, it's a cool effect, but it's not quite what I was looking for. The reason it does that is because the first parameter of it is hue, so whereas RGB kind of goes through the middle of the color wheel, so to speak, uh, HSL goes around the edge through different colors to get to the next one. LCH is a bit of a combination of lab and HSL. It's a different way of expressing lab, but it kind of goes through the hues a little bit here and there. So again, that's, that's that. There are some tweaks or improvements that could be made to this. The color space and format is particularly one that I didn't realize quite how big of an impact it would have on animating and transitioning colors. And it's not just animation and transitions too, it's linear gradients also. Anywhere you go from one color to another, the color format and the color space changes that. And that's the case for manual with the way I'm doing it or inbuilt using browser transitions. So consider which works best for you when you do that. Using the new Houdini APIs could allow me to make this in a slightly more performant way and I'm sure I'll be doing that at some point when it's uh, supported across the board. And like we have different animation timing functions like ease in, ease out, etc. cetera, uh, we, they could have a different interpolation function, works on the exact same principles instead of linear. Again, color theming and animating have gone through, it's based on a blog post I wrote. Check it out for demos and code samples and all of that. What's the color of this one like? Okay, that's, that's not too bad. Um, 
so my final topic, if any of you are keen-eyed, you'll have noticed them at the bottom of each slide, is generative mountain ridge dividers. So oh, it's a bit difficult to see in, with the colors here, uh, but there is, there is a divider there, I promise. Um, so when making my website, I really liked utilizing the different color themes I had to alternate the background colors of different sections. It's pretty common practice in design, breaks up the page a bit, makes it more interesting, breaks it into more manageable chunks. You just do that though and you end up with straight lines, which works for some sites, but I feel like as soon as you get beyond the landscape here, it changes the feel of the website having the straight lines. Um, so I wanted to lean into the mountain theme and have dividers there to fit that theme. So my first attempt was a quick one I threw together in a vector editor. My illustration skills could maybe do with a little bit of work, to be honest. Uh, but in isolation, it's okay, it's okay. Um, so here I'm just the same page, but got the same divider across each line. I think it's fair to say that when you see it twice in, in the screen at once, it looks a bit weird. Um, I tried tweaking it uh, in each time, each, each one with transforms, but it still didn't feel right. What I really wanted was for each one to be unique and to not have to make new ones every time I post a new blog post, edit my site, change, change those around, not have to go in and make a new different one, which meant making a way of generating new ones with code, probably JavaScript. So my keenness to generate some, I went straight in with my first thoughts, using math.random to make some lines go up and down a random amount, and it looks less like a mountain ridge and more like a kind of broken bed of nails, to be honest. Um, played around a bit with it, but nothing was even getting close with that. So after that previous resounding success, I, God forbid, actually did some research, actually read something on, uh, on what I was trying to implement, um, and looking for a simple and fast algorithm to make these lines. And what I found mostly came from game development in the form of terrain generation algorithms. A lot of it went straight over my head, but I found uh, this one called midpoint displacement, which is super simple, fits the bill perfectly. It's not often used in modern games, but for something like this, it's, it's ideal. And the way it works is you have a straight line across the page, take the middle point, move it up or down a random amount. S take each half of that, take the middle point, move it up and down a random amount. And you just keep going until it's detailed enough for you. Each time you make the random amount slightly less to get more fine-grained detail. And so here we go, a demo of that, of that technique, um, animating between several randomly generated ones. Um, looking vaguely mountainly, mountainy. I'll, I'll give myself a nine out of 10 on that one. Um, it generates in a few milliseconds and is a nice small SVG uh, I can use between each section. And the fact is SVG is perfect uh, because I can style it with CSS. I can use custom properties, pop it in the fill attribute to color it, um, use CSS clip path or with other SVG capabilities if I want to. So with a wee bit of uh, SVG and JavaScript, we've got some nice effects separating sections with that mountain ridge. I've gone for terrain generation here, but with different SVG commands, with different um, CSS, with different terrain gener uh, generation functions, we could have all sorts of different effects for different instances. If we want a city skyline, we just change the generation algorithm. Other ways of generating natural numbers like simplex noise, Perlin noise, would give different effects um, and something to play with. And as we write the SVG content to a string to mark up, it's just text, you can generate it anywhere you've got a programming language. So at first I did that all with um, client-side JavaScript, but you could move, I moved it to my static site generator to generate them in advance, no JavaScript required. Um, you could also do it depending on how you build your site, uh, server-side or on the edge, uh, on the edge is one I definitely want to give a, give a try, so it's different on every, on every load, but there's loads of options there because it's just simple SVG. Final time, have this blog post uh, on these, which includes the full code on the generation algorithm, uh, which is fairly straightforward, and uh, both for the points and the SVG path. Okay, so that was a bit of a rush through a few different things. Okay, colors are okay on this one. Um, I hope I've showed a bit of what some of the really nice creative stuff we could do with modern CSS and JavaScript by stringing a few simpler techniques together to show that 
with some fairly simple techniques, you can do something really effective, look really nice without, I think my website has about a kilobyte of JavaScript, very little needed. Um, I've got a few things to mention before we finish up. You're probably sick of me putting de video demos up here, but this is the last one. Um, it's basically just a combination of everything you've seen. Uh, parallax at the top with the layers moving at different speeds, a animated color theme, and then also a theme switcher for some fixed color themes, and the generative dividers at the bottom there. Bad news, I'm afraid. Um, I'm really, I'm really, I'm sorry about this, but you've all got some homework before, uh, before I go. No, don't, don't leave, I promise. <laughs> it's not that bad. First is to go and look for website inspiration. You can find it anywhere. Particularly, I find checking out other industries. Pop your head in, see what gets ideas flowing. Um, in the case of my website for this project, uh, was inspired quite a lot by video games, by video game development, and by digital art and design. Um, but other places I've found creative ideas and inspiration from include my houseplants, all sorts of different media, theater production. Even a few years ago, I used Caravan Dealer, just inspired a massive brainwave for a project <laughs> I was working on at the time. Um, the web platform has so many fantastic features and additions over the past and next decade make web development easier than ever. Take some of what I cover today, what any of the other speakers cover today, even if it's just one thing, have an explore, see what you can do, see what cool things you can make a browser do. And finally, go and make fun websites. Thank you.